You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, one of my favorite all-time authors is back on the show with me. Glenn Eric Hamilton drops by today to talk about his brand new Van Shaw mystery. It's called Island of Thieves, and uh, Glenn once again ratchets up the tension and uh, and just brings us an utterly enjoyable read. Um, if you love Van Shaw, if you've been following along, uh, you know, for these six books, this is a must have. If you're just being introduced to, to Van Shaw and, uh, and and Glenn Eric's fantastic series, this is a, a, a great entry point uh, to the series as well. Um, this is a must have. Go grab it today. When you're hearing this, the book came out yesterday and you can get it in every format that, uh, you know, books come in now. And uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, Welcome back to the show, Glenn. Hey, Hank. It's great to talk to you again. You too. Um, So since we talked last, you know, this, uh, the the world has kind of gone crazy a little bit. Uh, How have you and and your family fared over the last uh, (laughs) year or so? Yeah, I think we, I think you and I talked at at the very height of the pandemic was uh, last summer. And, uh, you know, at at that time, everybody, was pretty much just staying at home, not going anywhere. You know, uh, those who write were writing books without actually traveling, um, location scouting. Um, obviously, the world's opened up some, uh, quite a bit actually. But you know, there's still there's still worries uh, for a lot of us out there, and there's still like, there are cautionary notes. In the midst of that, uh, my family and I moved from Southern California, where we had been living for 16 years. Uh, back to my hometown. So we are now in uh, right in the heart of Seattle. And so uh, it's very uh, it was very odd to move during a pandemic time to plan to move during a pandemic time, even though we were all vaccinated by the time we we actually put things into boxes. But it was uh, it, it's very strange coming back to a city and we expected to rediscover the city. But the whole city is rediscovering the city at the same time. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all of these all of these businesses have either closed or reopened or changed or, you know, the West Seattle Bridge, which is one of the main conduits of the city, had to close completely uh, during the pandemic. And so now there's no through way to get to one of the major areas of the city. People have to go around, you know, so the city is itself sort of figuring out how to live again. Um, it's an exciting time to be here, but boy, there's a, there's a lot to learn. <laughs> it's it's like society just, you know, kind of hit the reset button in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, lots of bad stuff happened, obviously. Um, but some interesting things are, are coming out of this. You know, the, the, the people that look at, uh, at the world and, and the situation and say, you know, what, what can we do differently? What, what can we maybe approach um, with, uh, you know, a little better than we did last time? Th- those things are, are some of the more interesting, um, you know, thoughts coming out of where we are now. Yeah. How do we how do we learn from our errors and our mistakes? Um, you know, the ability to do that is what makes individuals as well as societies better people over time right is is the able to look being able to look with clear eyes at, at what you what you could have done better right um you know fail you know fail fail faster fail better right is that rule um in in making progress um as we know there's a you know there's a lot of elements of our society that are just not willing to admit anything was wrong or that anything might be wrong and and aren't willing to confront that um you know i i personally think though that the the impetus is on the side of, all right, how do we not have this happen again, right? That if, uh, for example, if we had 
like other countries are able to, if we were able to get very rigorous about pandemic structures early on, might have killed it off a lot earlier. You know, even pre-vaccine, we would have just uh, demolished its food supply. Whether that's possible in a, such a large country as America, whether that's um, whether that's even, even feasible to do is is another matter but that sort of attitude that we expect you know that sort of world war ii kind of we're all in this together attitude that we that we project um it will be interesting to see if another pandemic comes along in the future if we are able to learn from this yeah uh, glenn it's um i find it fascinating that you moved back to seattle because we've talked in the past about uh your your history, your your childhood in, in Seattle and growing up you know, on a sailboat and and just how much that place seeped into you and and the the way that you look at the world and and uh, the types of stories that you tell and 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 all of that stuff. Um, and, you know, you you were writing from a point of in Southern California of of remembering those times and and, and connecting with those places. Um, now that you're back there, um, do you feel that uh, that is in influencing your creative life to be back in that place? Yeah, it's it's early days yet. We've been in the apartment for a month. You know, we're just we're we're, we're barely rediscovering our neighborhood, much less the city. But part of the reason for moving back certainly was because I want to be more embedded with what's going on with the city itself. I want to be able to take, you know community leaders and knowledgeable people, subject matter experts who are local, out to lunch and pick their brains and talk about the city and talk about what's going on. You know, even though we were in Southern California, part of what got me started writing in the first place and made me want to specifically write Van's adventures here is seeing the city from an outsider's point of view now. Um, you know, once when you're in it, you don't really see it. As soon as you move away from it, you start getting a different perspective and saying, well, that's unusual. <laughs> now, that's a strange part of the city. How, how have I never thought about that before, right? Or that's a different, that's an attitude I grew up with that isn't necessarily shared by the place I'm living now. And so you know, seeing that from an outsider's perspective made me want to write about it while I was in Southern California. But the more I wrote about it from there, the longer the time went on, the more I was location scouting and interviewing people up here, um, the more I wanted to be locate you know located uh close by uh and and just be able to be in the city and and have the spirit of it it also makes uh, obviously location scouting a whole lot easier when i can just hop on the bus go to a different part of the city and check it out <laughs> we've we've talked about in the past your uh your main character van shaw and and how van came about and we'll put links in in the show notes to our previous conversations we've had to so people can kind of get up to speed on some of the conversations we've had in the past. But now that Van Shaw is uh, is is mature in a lot of ways, I mean, this is book six. Um, how have you gotten to know Van over these six books? And um, is it easier, uh, you know, to construct a, a new story? Um, for Van to to drop into, you know, now that you're at book six and, you know, maybe working on book seven now uh, that six is out, uh, you know, how, how is your relationship with Van for for lack of a better term? Yeah, he's he's dealing with more grown up problems. Certainly, he did. You know, it, 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 as you know, part of the many of the books uh, have flashback interstitial chapters, not all of them, uh, or they have uh, flashbacks within the story itself, where you'll see Van as a slightly more feral teenager, you know, roughneck. You'll see him in the military where he's he's still young and wild to a certain extent and learning his way and learning maybe not to be as reckless. Um, he's a grown man now. You know, he's about 31. He's had he's he's uh, he's been to war. He's had 10 years in the military. He's had at least a few years uh, learning to be a civilian, which he's still getting the hang of. Um, and, you know, he's got responsibilities. He's got he's got an ersatz family that he's put together. He's got close friends, um, you know, whether he is uh, entirely aware of of 
that he's not the 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 crazy kid of his youth. He he might still be struggling with a little bit or or figuring out. Um, yeah. But he has he has grown up problems, right? He has long term problems, and letting him wrestle with those sorts of things and maybe take on some of the questions that you know a, a man of that age would normally have as opposed to somebody who had maybe put their civilian life and and, and some of those adult responsibilities on hold for 10 years is a, a more fun question. Um, I always want the books to be about his growth and about his attitudes. Um, the new book gets into, you know, it, as you know, it deals a lot with uh, the ultra rich um, and the uh, and the effect that is, that has uh, on on Seattle and uh, and how major corporations have effects on Seattle. Um, and Van has his own uh, class resentment issues. Right. And he has to he has to confront that he will he will automatically have a chip on his shoulder for um, people of uh, of a higher economic class, whether they deserve it or not. Um, and so his his confronting that or that confronting him is certainly part of the story. Looking for a tool to help you visualize your story before the drafting begins? Plot Pins is cloud-based and optimized for any device. There's nothing to download. From the new writer who isn't sure how to tell their story to the veteran who can increase their productivity dramatically, we've had experienced writers lay out a detailed structure for several novels in a series in a matter of a few days. The app takes you through four steps of the process, the concept or logline. Make sure you have a solid concept that you can keep coming back to throughout the process. The outline, 12 beats and three acts, each has a description of what should be happening with examples. The board, 40 cards. We take the 12 beats and add sub beats to those, breaking it down even further and being very specific about what should go into each. These also have examples and descriptions. Write. We take those 40 cards and turn them into a to-do list. For a 50,000 word book, it's about two cards per chapter roughly. We have a beautiful editor built into the app. You can export your manuscript to a PDF anytime with the click of a button. Let Plot Pins help you visualize your writing project. Use code HANK10 to get 10% off Plot Pins. PlotPins.com Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website. Developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates, PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. So, Glenn, you know, um, getting to know you over the last few years, uh, you are a a solid um, stand-up guy, family man, um, just a, you know, salt-of-the-earth guy. Uh, Van Shaw is a little roguish. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> 
Um, oh, you know, good. I, my, I'm glad. I'm glad my ma- public mask hasn't slipped <laughs> then. So I'm glad I still seem like a family well, guy on the outside. That's you know, great. Hung firmly in cheek there. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I don't like um, some of the conversations that, that, you know, people say how much of you is is in your character that you write. And, um, you know, because th- there's there's lots of our personal selves in all of the characters on the page. And and a lot of times very rarely where readers think that it is, you know, and you, you can draw all sorts of conclusions that are that are just, you know, speculation. Um, but, you know, when. What is it about Van, uh, who seems like kind of a polar opposite character to you in a lot of ways? Um, what what is it about him that just fascinates you so much that that you want to you know keep going on these uh, these yeah. adventures with him? Yeah. Well, Van's and I, we may have touched on this in the previous interviews, but our our attitudes are often the same. You know, um, obviously Van is younger stronger there's all that wish fulfillment that comes with writing a yeah. you know a, a, a character that that every writer enjoys right you always come up with the with the right glib line at the right moment you know uh, it's the heightened reality that we get with fiction um but in a certain way you know, van is is me with the guardrails off right it's 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 not it, it, if uh if you see an injustice you act out against it. If you, uh, if a guy's being a jerk, you knock him down, right? Not that it's necessarily that simple for Van, but in a polite society and a reasonable society, we don't do those things, right? We're not that right. untethered, right? Um, in fiction, somebody can do that, right? And and should do that because it makes exciting choices, but it also makes for an exciting character because you're. You know, I'm not even sure Van is always in as as um, thoughtful and crafty a person as he can be and he can be pretty sly um he's not always aware of what he's going to do necessarily he will he will act on impulse or he he will go with his gut um and that makes for fun choices for sure when do you start thinking about um the next uh, adventure that that Van is going to have. Do, do you and are are there certain things that feed, um, you know what the the creative process or you know when you're starting with Van, we know that each book, it you know he's going to be involved in some way. Um, what are some of the things that that feed into the 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 plot ideas, the the scenarios that that you know Van's going to fall face first into in a lot of cases. Sure, sure. Well, some, you know, can come out of anywhere. It's, it's, I I don't ever think as as with a lot of writers, I'm never not looking for inspiration, right? And you're never quite sure where it's going to hit or, or what's going to happen. I might have a, like an, an A story plot idea occurs to me, like, you know, uh, and I had, I had one the other day, I won't reveal it because I'll probably use it. But I, uh, (laughs) (laughs) but, but I was just like, oh, that would be interesting. You know, uh, you know, uh, um, to to sort of uh, uh, see where that leads, right? And one of my one of my bugbears is, you know, part of the publishing process is writing synopses of of the book you intend to write and intending right. to sell the book to publishers. But almost any plot described in a page and a half sounds dumb. Um, or sounds or sounds rote right unless you want to give away the surprises and surprises are all about the execution not the fact of what happens right Right. so if you give away the big surprises in the synopsis then your editors and agents might be less thrilled with what they read eventually you know you want them to have the wow of seeing it on the page which is why personally i prefer to like give them a hundred pages of the new book rather than writing a page and a half synopsis yeah, in, well, a way a that, in a way that's easier. You know, yeah, it's but, like, here, because, see if this grabs you. If this yeah, grabs you, great. I'll write the rest. <laughs> yeah. And you're giving them a, a sense of the tone of the book. Exactly. Without, without spoiling what the, the big hook yeah. is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, that, let me, a, let me see if this sets the hook for you. And if it sets the hook for you, it'll set the hook for a reader. Right. You right. know, for, for Island of Thieves, probably some of the main ideas that came out of it is I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by private islands, private enclaves in general. There are private islands in the San Juans. Um, uh, they're not uh, established in, in to quite the extent that Briar Bay Island, which 
which is a fictional island I've invented near the coast of or near the border, uh, the sea border of uh, between the U.S. and Canada. Um, they're not they're not uh, uh, developed to that extent, but they certainly could be if somebody, you know, if a billionaire came along, bought an island and was willing to develop it to that extent, there's no reason a Briar Bay couldn't exist, right? It could be as this as this uh, magnet intends, um, sort of a Camp David West, a showpiece showpiece for both his himself and his you know uh, and his business uh, and his uh, multinational business, but also kind of uh, in, he's intending it as a um, the place where uh, corporate and political big wigs come to meet, right? That's how he's setting up Briar Bay, is to be that sort of thing. And uh, that's not far off reality. People have tried to do that in other locations. They could certainly do that in the San Juans if they wanted to. Um, I'm also fascinated to a certain extent, and have been for a long time, by uh, corporate espionage and the way that often attracts people who were in government espionage into the private sector. Um, you know, so people who learn spycraft for the CIA suddenly go to work for a private firm and are basically doing the same kind of jobs. You know, um, uh, that's always been an interest to me, especially as corporate espionage and government espionage have largely become the same thing now. Governments are not necessarily after military secrets as much as they're after corporate secrets because it's corporate secrets, it's corporate inventions and innovations that drive military innovation right now, rather than the other way around as it used to be. So that's a big part of, without revealing too much, that's a big part of Island of Thieves and uh, and uh, the shenanigans that are going on behind the scenes there. <laughs> I love uh, a good heist novel. There, uh, mm. There's just something fun that, that you just... Um, you know the the problems and the solutions and um you know how are these characters going to pull this off and and at first when i'm reading it i'm 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 like uh when i when i got into island of thieves okay this is going to be a, a heist novel with an in, interesting twist um you know van is uh is called upon to um to prevent something from happening you, you find out um and uh you know and he's he's uh He's brought on for his expertise, but not for why you think it's going to be. Um, yeah. But then, you know, you throw this extra twist in, uh, you know, you know, right when you think everything is going OK and, and things are going the way that they should, then a dead body shows up. Um, at what point did did you, you know, st I, I, well, let me let me ask it this way. When when you're thinking out the plots and, and what uh, what's going to happen in the book. Do you start looking for places where you can say, OK, let me see just how bad I can screw up Van's life now? Oh, yeah. And, and that's, where, yeah. that's where you throw a body in. <laughs> like like in the planning process of the book, do you look at it, it, it at the landscape of it and say, you know what, I need to I need to drop an unsolvable problem here? Um, do, you, do you approach it that way? Some sometimes sometimes it's 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 very um mechanics driven in terms of the plot of going okay we're gonna you know we're gonna s establish a location you're gonna you're gonna have him start his work and then something goes wrong and what is that right you know in this one i um i wanted it to go wrong really quick really quick really really fast um strangely enough this one started with just the mental image of the body on the beach um, I just had, you know, I, cause I know what the Rocky shores are, are you know, a, a, around that part look like, especially the really weather beaten ones and the clefts and hollows that you'll get in the beach, uh, when it's, when it's, you know, made of, of, uh, of rock that's been weathered over centuries. And I just had the image of the body stuck in the cleft in the beach with the arm held essentially aloft, like a hand out of the grave. You know, um, and uh, that image stuck with me. And I'm like, well, got to get that in there. So uh, <laughs> so really, weirdly enough, this one started with, although it's a logical place for it to go from a thriller plot perspective, this one kind of started from the, hmm, OK, I'm going to have that. I want Van to find that in the middle of the night. It's creepy. It's evocative. You know, um, it's it's unexpected. Let's let's just have it go askew right away rather than having it be a slow buildup. When 
at what point do you start thinking about the big themes? Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, these kind of out of control, um, rich people. Um, there's, um, you know, the, the theme of, uh, you know, how we, we judge a person uh, like we, um, uh, everyone assumes that Van is, uh, is, is going to be responsible for this dead body. And, and, you know, there, there's kind of that theme, um, are themes things that come about from the beginning and, and you start looking for ways to explore those themes or is it later in the writing or maybe, you know, at the end of the first draft where you then realize that there was these subconscious themes that just kind of rose through the book? It's it's more often than not, it's the latter. I sometimes don't know what I'm writing about until I've written it. I will write the first draft of the novel i'll set it aside for a couple of weeks i'll go i'll reread it and i'll go oh that's what i'm talking about okay <laughs> and then yeah. in rewrites i'll punch that up right um i knew a little bit from the start of this one just because i knew it was i was dealing with a private island and people who have the kind of money that makes private islands you know and van was going to you know brush shoulders with those people i knew i had to bring out some of his class consciousness which has come out in in a little bit in previous books, but this time we're kind of confronting it directly and his friends are even, you know, uh, uh, nudging him on it along the way. It's like, you know, you, you needle, you needle rich people. So they'll know that they're not impressed with you is what they're telling, <laughs> telling Van, right. You know, pointing out his fl flaws in his own personality. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, so, uh, so some of that I knew I was going to address right from the start, but a will they're almost always thematically, I got to write a book and then figure out what it's really about, what's going on in my head. Uh, and then I go, oh, OK, this is this is what we're saying here. So then I can go back and and underline that with whatever it happens to be, you know, whether it's ex extra lines or motifs or imagery or whatever, it, whatever it might be. Um, but it's uh, I, I think somehow it's more resonant that way because it works yeah. more at a subconscious level. I, I don't I don't think theme I think it's rare that theme works, maybe better writers than I can do it. It's rare that theme works if you're clubbing the reader over the head with it. Sure. I think it almost always works as if it's subconscious. Well, and by that same token, is it ever OK for a writer to write things that they don't necessarily believe? Um, like, um, can you believably pull off, um, uh, you know, playing the devil's advocate and exploring a subject or subject matter from a position that you don't necessarily believe, but maybe the character does? Um, is that something that, that you ever try? Um, yes, yes, because you try it with, with, you try it with, um, supportive characters. Sure. You know, ones who don't believe necessarily what Van does. And, uh, in, in this, book um we haven't mentioned it yet but island of thieves is the first van shaw book that's written in third person um i've written a story yes. a short story in third person before but in this one in particular because it's a larger more sweeping story i wanted the ability to cut away from van occasionally and see things from other characters points of view um often very harsh points of view you know i don't necessarily think like those characters at all but it's easy enough in kind of a lawyerly fashion to go, how do I make this argument, right? What would what would be logical to this person's point of view and how would they express it? Um, and that's a lot of fun to do, um, as well as as well as flexing different writer muscles, uh, which is always a good time. I write better when I'm a little scared, honestly, <laughs> and try something new. Um, it, I think it's more interesting for the reader because suddenly you realize the villain isn't. Um, isn't two dimensional. They are, they've got their own points of view and reasons for doing things. They may not be sympathetic, but you understand their rationale. Sure. Sure. Um, speak, I'm glad you brought up the, um, the perspective, uh, of the book because it, this is third person perspective. And, and instead of us having that very close first person view, um, that the other five books give us, um, what did this and, and you alluded to it a, a minute ago, but what did this give you in your writer toolbox um, that maybe you you didn't expect to get by changing your perspective? Yeah, yeah. There, there's there's one thing I did I did expect, which is one of my my prime reasons for doing it, which is 
you get to see the protagonist, who by now I know and some readers know very well, through different people's eyes. Um, and it isn't the way that he thinks of himself. So that's fun. Um, but it's also uh, back to theme for a second. It also works for that structure because part of the plot and the, the theme hinges on how people perceive Van, right? He is scarred. He is large. He is, you know, youngish uh, at, at 30, 31. Um, you know, he's looked on as, as being, you know, a, a blue collar uh, brute to a certain extent, which he is not. Um, he's comfortable in that world, but he's a lot more thoughtful and, and a little more sensitive than that. Um, but people will perceive him as that at first glance and make assumptions. And so with the third person, we get to we get to explore that a little bit um, and even drive some of the plot based on it. What I didn't expect about going third person and opening it up is um it I had to I had to restrict those characters to just their scenes, even though I wanted to write about them. <laughs> it's like there were there were some characters they, they only get one or two scenes from their perspective thoroughly um to establish things, but there was the there was kind of a drive there to say, okay, once I've done that, do I real do I need to follow their thread all the way through to the end of the story? Well, no, I don't. And it's already, you know, the longest book I've I've written because we've opened it up to these these new characters. Uh, I, I don't have to do that. I want to as a writer. I want to see their perspective on these different scenes. You know, there's the urge almost sometimes with some scenes to write them from three different perspectives to give each character's thoughts in it or write it from an omniscient point of view. But that's not that doesn't work very well for this kind of thriller or what I wanted to create. Um, but it, it's encouraging that I'm enjoying writing from other characters' perspectives. And I think I'm going to be doing, I'll be doing more of it very soon. Did, did you begin the book feeling comfortable um, with that perspective or did it take a little bit to, you know, to, were you looking around to seeing if anyone was looking at you breaking the rules <laughs> you, you know <laughs> yes it did it, it felt like that a little bit at the start you know we we talked last time i think about the short story i had written for van uh showing yeah. van at the start of the of covid and the, sure. the lockdown uh quarantine um and that was deliberately written in the third person for me to practice uh as 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 a practice run um and that felt good and but but yes, there's always when you when you switch something that dramatically in your writing style or writing approach, there's always the I hope I can pull this off kind of feeling, uh, you know, and um, really the tests are when you give it to your your agent and your editor and seeing how they react. You know, is it is it is it uh, is it suddenly too removed because you've gone from this very close first person to suddenly talking about Sean, the third person. Um, and uh, fortunately be in on his thoughts and know what's going on so you don't have to you, you get to not cheat but you get to still have that into of knowing what's going on in his head so speaking of uh of the covid pandemic um their writers are, are kind of split on whether um we should mention um you know the pandemic in in thrillers uh, some people think that you know it it really happened and the the characters of our books ought to have to wrestle with this in the same way that we have other folks are are kind of of the opinion that you know we've already lived through it we don't want to live through it in our fiction um let's give readers an escape from from all of this um Karen Slaughter was uh was on the show a, a few days ago and and she uh, talked about adding you know this uh story thread in her newest book even though it's not the main story thread their you know, <clears throat> characters are dealing with it and and how important that was uh to her to do that um how do you feel about you know where you know being on the tail end hopefully of the pandemic and it's you know mostly in the rear view mirror um how how are you going to approach it going forward and do you hope to see um you know the thriller community that do you hope to see more pandemic thrillers out there or you know are you happy to leave it 
where it is <laughs> in the rear view mirror. I, I hope yes. it's, I hope it's to a certain extent in the rear view mirror in real life as well as yeah, in fiction. me too. I'm, um, I'm, although I'm talking although, positively. Al- yeah. Although I guarantee somewhere out there right now, maybe multiple somewheres, someone is writing a brilliant pandemic, uh, uh, thriller. Maybe they've already written it. I'm just, I just have, it just hasn't crossed my, my, my radar yet. Um, but uh, I guarantee somebody will make great art from this terrible time. Um, and uh, and so that, that will be spectacular for, for me, for Island of Thieves. I, I, when I very first started writing it, I thought, OK, I've written a pandemic story about Van. I'm going to write this in a vacuum. And then very quickly I went, nope, that's not fair. That's not fair to Seattle. That's not fair to reality. Um, I have to some mention of it because, and, but then you have to decide, all right, when is this set? You know, is this post-vaccination, pre-vaccination? Do I even mention vaccinations? Maybe we won't have one by the time the book comes out, you know, so you've got all these choices to make. Um, I made, uh, I guessed, <laughs> of course, <laughs> and, um, what I did was I, it's, it's set in and around end of June, uh, the, the latter half of June and July 4th weekend of 2021. Um, and in the book, the world has essentially opened up. A lot of people are still wearing masks, but the world has essentially opened up. I don't mention, I don't think I mentioned vaccinations at all, but, but essentially I put it a post pandemic, but not, not a lot post pandemic. Right. And I have a few mentions of it here and there, but not a lot, just to let you make you aware that, you know, on people's minds from time to time. I'm not even sure there's a mention really early in the book or not. Um, but certainly in crowd scenes, Van muses on it a little bit. I almost got the timing right, uh, just by chance. Um, the world hadn't quite opened up that far by July 4th weekend, but it was getting close. So that was that was luck on my part. And I even put a note at the time I had to write the author's note. We were still in the process. The, they were still in the pro- early days of rolling out the vaccine because uh, I had to write that, I think, back in March or so or, or even even February. Um, and so I basically said. Uh, you know, in the author's note, I, 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 I took a shot, you know, it may, it may not be quite accurate, but you know, it was, it was optimistic and hopeful. And that's what I was going for. Glenn, how is, um, how is being in Seattle, um, going to, um, open up the, the creative process of, of beginning new novels? Do you, are, are you sensing that just being in this place will, um, you know, will we'll bring new fodder for stories. Uh, are, are you are you feeling hopeful that the the change of scenery is is going to keep adding fire to uh, to Van Shaw? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I think I think what it's going to bring is some some of the some of the stuff that was more difficult before, which was uh, choosing a location, scoping it out, figuring out where a thing has to be set suddenly becomes much easier, obviously, just by dint of geography. Um, what that frees me up to do is, as I said, interview local people, talk about their experiences, you know, understand to a deeper extent what's going on in the community and the and the very real challenges facing the city and having Van be involved in those. Um, and not even Van, you know, there's I'm actually drafting the first part of a standalone now that um, it isn't actually set within Seattle itself. But as I'm thinking about that book and gathering information for that book, I'm getting threads of other stories that I'm and and other happenings around the community that I'm really interested in. Um, You know, it 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 uh, it makes a difference when you can walk out your door and have a conversation with the guy panhandling on the street corner and uh, and get his perspective, you know, get his thoughts on things um, and and talk about you know, where he spends his nights and how he uh, how he how he sees the city and what, what his hopes and, and aspirations are. You know, I'm, I'm being sort of uh, I hope this doesn't come off as glib, but it's it's a, 
ideas of storylines are easy when you're paying attention when you're when you're when you're talking to to folks who are around and about it's really just choosing a perspective and then crafting a thriller around that without making it um uh, uh without sort of bleeding off people's real experiences if that makes sense yeah. Yeah. you know you you don't want to you don't want to be um uh taking advantage of people's real lives well, I can't wait to see what comes next, Glenn. Um, Island of Thieves, one of my favorite books of the year so far. I, I think it's definitely gonna to, gonna make my uh, my top ten list for the end of the year. I I know um, uh, such a, a unique story. Um, and I love the way that you took um, concepts that that we're all familiar with, and then find new ways to uh, you know to to bring them to fruition. Such a fun book. Uh, we're going to send so everyone. Much, yeah, absolutely. We're going to send everyone to pick up their copy. It's available Kindle edition or hardcover, and um, I'm I'm holding the hardcover here, and it's such a gorgeous um, book. Also, audio book. Um, you know, Glenn, I'm loving the audio books um, of the uh, of the Van Shaw series. I, I think I've collected all five of the previous ones. And uh, how do you feel about about having your books? translated to audio and in kind of this um audiobooks are, are nothing new but they're definitely um we're we're experiencing a golden age of audio for for sure you you took the words right out of my mouth yeah this is this is a this is a fantastic time for audiobooks because not only is the technology so easy for everyone to get, uh, which it used to yeah. be like you had to buy the either buy the CDs or get them from your library, right? Uh, back in the day, um, yeah. not only is the technology so much easier to get, but the the wealth of talent out there narrating books is just phenomenal. Oh, you know, you incredible. ask you ask how I feel about it, and it's just like wow, what these actors can do is really impressive. Um, we have a we have a good friend in the LA area who is a, a, a professional narrator uh, of audiobooks, uh, Nicole Zanzarella. Um, and she, uh, you know, she and I have, have talked about this a little bit. And I'm, I'm always just amazed by how they can take a book with 30 different characters, 30 different voices, and without making it sound cartoonish, give every voice their own <laughs> intonation, their own take, um, and make it sound fresh across reading, you know, 400, 500 pages. That that is a that is a fun, and they do it fast. That is a phenomenal skill. I don't think people realize just how hard it is to narrate a book <laughs> and do it and do it well and do it quickly. Absolutely, absolutely. Island of Thieves available everywhere now. When you're hearing this, uh, go grab it from the links in the show notes, or go visit your local bookstore and, and grab uh, the hardcover today. Uh, there's it's going to look great on your shelf, uh, but e even better, um, you know, as you pick it up and read it, it maybe each evening uh, this summer. I highly recommend it. Glenn, always fun to catch up. Um, tell people where they can find you online if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you do. Absolutely. Um, uh, central place to start is my website. It's just GlennEricHamilton.com. Glenn with one N, Eric with a K. Um, I have a newsletter. Actually, a new newsletter just came out this morning. Um, I don't overburden people with a lot of newsletters. You know, when a book comes out, I'll maybe send one every couple of weeks. But mostly it's going to be more like one and a quarter, you know, just catching folks up on news and happenings, not just book sales stuff, um, but like what's happening in Seattle that, you know, the family's doing, you know, what am I reading right now? You know, recommendations of other books, giveaways, stuff like that. So I encourage folks to sign up for the newsletter. You can all uh, again, that's GlennEricHamilton.com. You can also find me on Twitter at GlennEricH um, and around on Facebook. Very easy to find as well. Um, I love chatting with readers. Um, I'll do my standard encouragement here, which is if you like a, if you like a book, if you like an author, go leave a review, even a short one on Goodreads or on Amazon. Publishers really pay attention to that. And it's the best way to support authors, especially authors whose readership is still growing. That's the way to get them noticed. Absolutely. We'll put links uh, in the show notes to make it easy for folks to go do that very thing. Pick up a copy of Island of Thieves, leave a review, 
Glenn, uh, always fun uh, catching up. I, I love the new book and uh, and much success in the future, buddy. Thanks so much, Hank. Great to talk to you as always. Wargate Books presents Hit and Fade, Forgotten Ruin, Book Two, by Jason Onspach and Nick Cole, narrated for you by Christopher Ryan Grant. Chapter One. The army of the dead walked straight into our ambush east of Fortress Hawthorne. That's what the fob is called now, Fortress Hawthorne. Despite it being officially known as Forward Operating Base Hawthorne, as was originally intended when the 50 detachments of various special operations groups came forward through time from Area 51, a one-way mission to save Western civilization from a rampaging nano-plague destroying the very fabric of said civilization. Apparently, we overshot the temporal insertion point and stuck the landing. Sorta. About 10,000 years too late. Said civilization is now basically something straight out of Tolkien, or Dungeons and Dragons which we've all now gotten a lot more familiar with thanks to our resident expert and fledgling hedge wizard, the infamous P.F.C. Kennedy. But the Rangers just call it the FOB. The first of our explosives to ruin the leading elements of the Army of the Dead advancing on us, Claymore Mines, the recaptured forge back at Hawthorne, had cranked out in the weeks after we'd retaken it from King Triton, were fired by Ranger Sergeant Kang down there with the scouts and Captain Knifehand's assaulters. It was close to midnight when the front rank of bony warriors, carrying rotting shields and spears, eyes glowing malevolently in the deep night mist, advanced into our ambush, only to get ruined by the daisy-chained Claymore's sudden eruption. Above us, a cloud-shrouded moon cast a wan yellow light over the battlefield. The night was hot, and spring was coming on full now. The pilots who'd gotten us here in the grounded C-17 back at Ranger Alamo, using their meteorology skills, had guessed it was going to be a long, hot summer ahead of us, and an early one at that but there was a cold shiver in the dark on your exposed skin that you couldn't quite explain when you saw the dead advancing rank after rank. The bone warriors carrying spear and shield, other darker creatures barely seen. The lower areas of the earth were graveyard cool and misty, so maybe that was it. Still, the brutal, unrelenting cold of our almost last stand back at Ranger Alamo was gone now. But not the horrors. There wasn't a night that some ranger didn't wake up out of a tormented sleep, breathing heavy, sidearms scanning the dark and looking for orcs and ogres to ventilate. I was sweating in the hour leading up to the attack, despite the night and the mist. Kurtz had us humping hard to get the 240 and all its ammo up to the top of a small hill that overlooked the area where we'd channel the advancing echelons of the Army of the Dead into further fun and games the rangers had planned at a bend in a riverbed. If the approaching Army of the Dead continued on their current course track, they'd enter it for a brief period. It was decided by the captain we'd kill them there and I was sweating. Not because of fear. No, not at all. Firing, whispered Sergeant Kang over the calm as he detonated the mines, and eight daisy-chained claymores spat thousands of steel balls all across the front line of what even I was still finding it hard to believe I was seeing through my night vision device. Skeletons. Warrior skeletons. Ancient warriors like something out of the Bronze or Iron Ages. Worked breastplates of molded plate or rotting scales. Green and tarnished, stamped with the markings of fabled armies fallen in battles long, long ago. Leather cuirasses on some. Rotting boots. Helms with broken horns, missing teeth, tattered leather kilts. 
beads and charms dangling from bone wrists, enigmatic holy signs and primal torques black with grave dirt or from a funeral pyre long ago on some forgotten battlefield far from here, draped about the spine where the throat should be, where it rises to connect to a bone-white skull that seems filled with malevolent purpose and diabolical intelligence, malignantly so. Walking skeletons like something out of a Ray Harryhausen clay model Sinbad epic from the 1960s. Above, the sliver of moon gave enough light to strengthen our NVGs, making the night vision devices perform exceptionally well as we sprang our trap and watched the advancing elements get rocked by our initial high-explosive opening bid in the game we were about to play. The air was still and hot in the moments before the fight began as we lay there in the tall, sharp grass, waiting for it all to go down. I was thinking a hot cup of coffee would be nice about now, except my canteen only had cold coffee I'd brewed during the long, silent, and windy afternoon of preparation. Still, I was happy knowing I had some, rather than none. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical, yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started.